Hello, anyone who might be interested in watching my free online organic chemistry lecture videos. I'm Dr. Mike Christiansen from Utah State University's regional campus in Vernal, Utah. I produced a series of lecture videos that I posted online for my second semester sophomore organic chemistry students last semester. And I did it in an an attempt to develop a new pedagogy called flip teaching which turned out in my view to be quite successful. I'm now posting all of those lecture videos online on YouTube for anyone who's interested in getting a free education in organic chemistry. I'm trying to the best of my ability to organize these lecture videos so that they'll be easily accessible to anyone who wants to see them worldwide. I have to warn you however that the first couple of lecture videos are a little bit boring and slightly dry. That's because I was still trying to get used to the whole process of making videos at all. I hope that you guys will be willing to sit back and watch them, share them with your friends or anyone else that you know of who might be interested in gaining an organic chemistry education for free. And, uh, and by all means, enjoy. Dang it, it's good to have you here. Thanks. Last semester we covered numerous fundamental principles such as spectroscopy, stereochemistry, Newman and chair conformations, aromaticity, and reaction arrow pushing mechanisms. This semester we'll be delving more deeply into chemical reactions. In other words, I'll be teaching you how to convert numerous starting materials into various products using specific reaction conditions. Now you may ask, why in the world would we care about learning so many different reactions? Well, as it turns out, organic chemistry is the art of assembling molecules. The vast majority of all medicines used today, even those that are made by nature, are actually synthesized by organic chemists. Why? Because for most medicines and other useful natural compounds, we couldn't go to nature and obtain a sufficient quantity to use as a medicine without ravaging nature. So what do we do? We organic chemists come up with ways of synthesizing those same molecules artificially in the lab using organic chemistry. Furthermore, there are many unnatural molecules that also have many useful properties that can only be made by using organic chemistry. Synthesizing a molecule is much like playing with Legos. For those of you who are like me, that is, who have experience playing with Legos, you'll recognize that the final constructed product in this case, a farmer with two animals in a watering trough is not what you see when you open the box. So how do you get the final product? Well, you follow the instructions and assemble that product one step at a time using simple building blocks. Assembling molecules is very similar. However, instead of adding pieces by using our hands, we have to use chemical reactions. In the case shown here, the research group I was in as a graduate student wanted to assemble this molecule, which is called esnaproxen. It's an anti-inflammatory medicine known by various commercial names, including Aleve. To make this drug, which, like our Lego playset, is somewhat structurally complex, we began with molecule 1, which is cheap and commercially available. By treating it with these reaction conditions, which you really don't have to understand yet, we converted molecule 1 into molecule 2. Just like adding pieces to our growing Lego playset with our hands, we then converted molecule 2 to molecule 3 using these reaction conditions. Using subsequent chemical reactions, we converted 3 to 4, 4 to 5, and 5 to our final target, which was this anti-inflammatory drug, esnaproxen. And how, once again, did we add pieces to our growing molecule? By using chemical reactions. That's what organic chemists do. I guarantee you that there probably isn't a single human on Earth who isn't a beneficiary of organic chemistry, even though most of us are completely ignorant of that fact. Nearly every medicine, every synthetic fabric and material, every food preservative and flavoring, as well as many pesticides and countless other substances we use in our daily lives were invented and developed through the use of organic chemistry. 
With that said, we now launch into chapter 16, which will cover numerous reactions of substituted benzenes. As we learn these reactions together, I want you guys to keep in mind the big picture. Why do we care about learning so many reactions? Because once we master these reactions, we can use them to assemble virtually any useful molecule we can imagine. This slide shows a list of all the things you should be able to do after studying chapter 16. Because I anticipate that you can read as well as I can, I'm not going to read these bullet points to you. Instead, I'll let you read them for yourself as desired by pausing the video now. If not, then let's keep going. To begin, I want to remind you of a reaction we covered back in chapter 12, the treatment of an alkylated benzene with NBS. I wish to remind you here that the word alkyl in organic chemistry refers to any chain of carbons and hydrogens. In this example, I have a three carbon long chain called a propyl group attached to my benzene ring. Thus, my alkylated benzene is a benzene that has an alkyl chain, in this case a propyl group dangling off of it. So here's the reaction I want to remind you of. If I treat an alkylated benzene with Br2 or NBS and light, and usually NBS works better than Br2 for this reaction, then I can attach a bromine at the benzylic carbon. You should remember two things here. The benzylic carbon is the carbon that's immediately attached to the benzene ring. And in order for this reaction to work, the benzylic carbon in the starting material has to have at least one hydrogen attached to it. Guys, I thought of a great way to remember that a benzyl carbon is one carbon away from his fellow carbons inside a benzene ring. And that is by remembering this song. Benzyl, 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 benz, one away from his friends. Ooh. An allyl carbon also reacts similarly with NBS to a benzyl carbon. There's a great way of remembering what an allyl, allyl carbon looks like. He is one carbon away from uh, two carbons that are doubly bonded to each other in an alkene. So you can remember this song. Allyl, 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 al, one away from his pals. Ooh. You have to add the falsetto ooh at the end or else the song won't be as silly. You might ask here, why, Mike, are you reviewing this stupid reaction? Well, as it turns out, once you have a bromine on the benzylic carbon, you can do lots of really useful things with it. As you may recall from chapter 8, a bromine is a really good leaving group which means that if I react it with a nucleophile, the nucleophile can displace and substitute itself for the bromine. Thus, the nucleophile comes in, attacks the benzylic carbon, kicks off the bromide as a leaving group, and takes its place. This type of substitution reaction is called an SN2 reaction. Here are various examples from section 16.1 of different substitutions I might do for my benzylic bromine. Foremost, I can react benzyl bromide with OH minus hydroxide, which could arise from sodium or potassium hydroxide, for instance, to generate this product, benzyl alcohol. Alternatively, I can displace my bromide with a cyanide nucleophile to form phenylacetonitrile, as shown here. Or, if I wish, I can use ammonia, NH3, as my nucleophile and displace the bromide to form this ammonium salt. When this ammonium salt is neutralized with hydroxide, it then gives me benzylamine. These reactions are all extremely useful. I'd like you to show me how to arrive at any of these three products directly from benzene in a single step. Can you? Absolutely not. We have to go through a substituted benzene that's been brominated at the benzylic position. Another reaction we can do if we have a bromine at the benzyl carbon is an elimination reaction. 
Thus, by treating the brominated starting material with a bulky base like potassium or sodium tert-butoxide, I can form styrene, shown here. This reaction is an E2 elimination reaction, which we covered back in chapter 9. One cool thing you can do with styrene is to treat it with hydrogen gas and palladium, which will then reduce it to ethyl benzene. The humorous thing about this slide is that if you were to treat ethyl benzene with NBS and light, you would actually brominate the benzylic carbon and convert ethyl benzene back to our original starting material, 1-bromo-1-phenylethane. Thus, converting 1-bromo-1-phenylethane through this sequence to ethyl benzene in reality would be a stupid waste of time. However, it does illustrate the ability of doing an E2 reaction when you have a bromine at the benzylic position, thus forming an alkene. And as you may remember from previous chapters, there are many reactions that we can do to alkenes. Just to review, I thought I'd show you here the mechanism for the E2 reaction featured in the previous slide. Once again, I have my bromine bonded to my benzylic carbon, and my bulky tert butoxide base comes in and grabs a hydrogen that's on the carbon adjacent to the benzylic carbon. Upon doing that, it thrusts these electrons in, closing them like a door on a hinge, and kick off the bromide leaving group. This forms my double bond featured in styrene, along with tert butanol and bromide byproducts. I'm now going to move on to another reaction shown in section 16.1. This reaction is the oxidation of benzylic carbons. You see, if you have an alkylated benzene and the benzylic carbon is bonded to at least one hydrogen, then you can react that compound with certain conditions to convert it into this product here, which is called benzoic acid. Interestingly enough, it doesn't matter whether these R groups in the starting material are alkyl chains of any length or branching pattern, or just hydrogen atoms as well. These conditions will convert any starting material of this type to the same product, benzoic acid. And what are the conditions? Well, they're the ones shown here. Caminophorin water, or sodium dichromate. Thus, if you take any compound of this type, regardless of whether R1 or R2 are alkyl chains of any branching type or just hydrogens, it will convert this type of product into benzoic acid if treated with potassium permanganate and water or sodium dichromate. I do not want you guys to worry about knowing the mechanism for this reaction. Now, by comparison, if we use a milder oxidizing reagent, manganese dioxide, MnO2, it will only oxidize a starting material up one oxidation state to this type of product. So if this, for example, this R group were an H, then what I have is my starting material's benzyl alcohol. If I treat that with manganese dioxide, it will oxidize it up one bond to benzaldehyde. If, by comparison, this is an alkyl chain, then this is a secondary benzyl alcohol. It will be oxidized up to the ketone shown here. Manganese dioxide will only work if you're starting with a primary or secondary alcohol. So let's move on to some actual problems. I want you to predict the products of each of the following reactions. Because I'm going to discuss the answers to these problems on the next slide, this might be a good place for you to pause the video and attempt to do them first on your own. So here are the answers. Whenever you see an alkylated benzene being treated with camino for water or sodium dichromate, it doesn't matter how branched the alkyl chain is. All you have to do is ask yourself one question. Is the benzylic carbon bonded to at least one hydrogen? So I'm going to ask you that question for this first example. Is the benzylic carbon right here bonded to at least one hydrogen? Well, the answer is yes. So if I take this starting material and react it with camino 4 water, what product does it make? 
benzoic acid. Let's take a look at this benzyl alcohol. You might remember that manganese dioxide is not as reactive of an oxidizing agent as KMnO4. So if I take this benzyl alcohol and react it with manganese dioxide, what happens? Well, it only goes up one oxidation state, or one bond to oxygen, to make this product, benzaldehyde. Let's look at our next starting material, this isopropyl benzene. If I treat that with sodium dichromate, what product is it going to make? Well, all I have to do is look at this benzylic carbon and ask the question, is it bonded to at least one hydrogen? The answer is yes. So what product will it make? Benzoic acid. This same product would be achieved if I take, took this same starting material and treated it with KMnO4 water as well. Now let's look at this starting material, tert-butylbenzene. Is there a hydrogen bonded to the benzylic carbon? The answer is no. So if I treat it with KMnO4 water or with sodium dichromate, what will it do? There will be absolutely no reaction. This, I think, is a great place for us to stop our video from chapter 16. Please take a break, get some snacks, go to the bathroom, or do whatever it is that you need to to get recharged. Then return and watch the next video segment to continue with chapter 16.